Hello, and welcome to Core Concepts in Robotics. I'm Sanjay Chaudhary, Assistant Professor at Cornell and a Research Scientist at Aurora. Today, we'll explore the concept of imitation learning. What is imitation? Why is it useful? If you think of imitation as simply replicating an observed behavior, there's a fair bit of that in the animal kingdom. For example, chimpanzees demonstrate such an ability, and it's possible this is useful to pick up skills for survival or social harmony. But if you think of the kind of imitation that we as humans engage in, it's certainly not by merely copying the action of others. For instance, our ancestors must have relied on imitation to acquire concepts such as making a campfire. Perhaps this involves successfully guessing explanations of what the other person is trying to achieve. Well then, what about robots? What does it mean for a robot to imitate? And why would they need to do this in the first place? To answer this question, we need to get into the mind of a robotics developer, programming robots that must work alongside humans doing human-like tasks. A good place to start is self-driving. This is a hyperlapse of a fully autonomous truck driven without any human intervention. The software that is driving this truck was designed here at Aurora, where I work. It's fascinating to see the robot drive alongside humans in the real world, engaging in novel interactions like merges, lane changes, stop signs, unprotected left turns, and much more. And all of this is programmed via imitation learning. Let's look at one particular snapshot and ask, what is the optimal action that the robot can take? You might think, why not take every rule in the official driving handbook and just apply that? That would not be very useful because most of the rules of driving aren't explicit, but rather implicit. This orchestrated chaos that you see is what we call traffic back home. It's absolutely unclear to me if I can engineer a set of rules to get a robot to repeat this feat. Now, you don't have to travel far to encounter complex interactions. Think about an unprotected left. It's actually a complex coordinated game where cars are waiting on each other, on pedestrian, or the occasional cyclist that just pops out. Or think about a gridlocked intersection where cars are staying stopped even with a green light. The robot must pick up on cues on when to go and complete the turn. Explicitly programming such rules is tedious. This is why it's hard to design robots that can truly work alongside humans. For instance, in self-driving, the right rule depends very much on what other humans are doing. But interestingly, we humans are able to seamlessly drive every day. This must mean that the optimal behavior is somehow implicit in our driving. So, can we implicitly program robots by having them imitate human driving? Let's take a look at how this would work. The simplest thing to do is to collect a bunch of human driving data. Think of data as a pair of state and actions. The state is a description of the scene, for example. Is there an upcoming merge? What are the position of all the actors? And so on. The action is the output steering angle break and throttle. Now here the human decides to go over to the left lane as a courtesy to the merging actors. In the next time step, we straighten out to complete the lane change. Once the passenger car crosses over, we move back right to the original lane. Finally, we straighten out to complete the lane change behind the truck. And so our objective is to learn a mapping from state to actions to drive like a human. Now, while this may sound simple, we run into a very interesting problem. To fully appreciate the problem, let's look at the minimalist example of learning when to stop or go at a traffic light. Easy, right? Here's the scenario. You just started a self-driving company. You have a demo with investors and you want to show that your product has learned to stop or go at a traffic light purely from human demonstrations. So we go out and collect data of human driving. As, as expected, 
Humans come to a stop at a red light, so the action sequence will look like stop, 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 and so on. At a green light, they continue going, so the action sequence looks like go, go, go. But sometimes there may be a cyclist in the scene that's crossing. And then even though there's a green light, the humans will come to a stop. So initially they were going, but upon seeing the cyclist, they come to a full stop. Okay, let's do some learning. So recall we're going to map state, the description of the scene, to actions, what the robot should do. The mapping is referred to as a policy pi. For our purposes, this will be some neural network that does the job. So what should we select as state? Obviously, the state of the traffic light is one. We also want to know the position of other actors in the scene, like where the cyclist is, and a bunch of other stuff that may be helpful. The output action is either stop or go. Good, so you train your model and find that it's not too bad maybe 80% accuracy both at train and test time. You drive around your model and it seems to reflect this on the road. Now, at this point, your company hires an enthusiastic intern to make this model better. And what do they do? They experiment with some features and ultimately settle on one, the action at the previous time step. So whether you stopped or go at the previous time step. You get an exciting Slack message one evening from them. Wow, we got 99% accuracy. And before you say overfitting, I added regularization and checked out on a held out data set. You are stunned. The intern is overjoyed. The team goes for beers. Next day, you test this model on the road with bated breath. 99% should mean pretty perfect response, right? You see a green light and the car seems to be going till it break jabs, which by the way is okay, but it continues stopping to a standstill. Now you have a robot on a public road that is stopped at a green light, even if there's no reason to. What happened? Let's open up the model to see which feature was the culprit. When we look at the model, it says, if the previous action was stop, I'm going to stop, which seems like a very strange policy to learn. If you look back at the training data, you see that there's a very strong path from the previous action to the current action. This explains the 99% accuracy metric. It's not surprising at all. Humans drive smoothly. Of course, consecutive actions are correlated across time. I mean, if you are stopping, you'll continue stopping. If you are going, you'll continue going, other than the rare transitions between stop to go. And that is what happens at test time. Once the robot begins stopping, it continues stopping. And this creates a what we call a bad feedback loop. In case you're wondering, is this even a real problem? Let me assure you it is. Here are four papers from the last few years that talk about this very issue. Codeville et al. described this exact example and called this the inertia problem. Bansal et al. from Waymo described the same problem as well. Kufler et al. talk about this more generally as a feedback cycle that can lead to cascading errors. And finally, Dehan et al. put an interesting twist where the previous action feature shows up as the brake light indicator. Wait, what's going on? Is machine learning broken? Thankfully, the answer is no. The problem is fundamentally with that of feedback. Even if you didn't add the previous action, just by the fact that we are in a dynamical systems where actions affect the states you end up in, any mistake made by the learner feeds back his input thus leading to even more errors, which further feedback creating this compounding effect. Feedback compounds errors. This is the fundamental aspect of imitation learning that makes it different from mere supervised learning. Feedback breaks a core assumption in machine learning that data is IID. In fact, the distribution of inputs or states depend very much on the policy we are learning. 
This shift in the input distribution is known as a covariate shift. To better understand this shift, let's look at our problem more abstractly. We have a human policy that visits a sequence of states in any given trial. Now, if you repeat trials over and over again, we see a distribution of states that concentrate in a region. This is the training distribution that the learner sees. Now, when we execute the robot policy, we see that the robot shoots off from this region. That's because of the compounding errors caused by feedback. The robot visits states that the human would never visit, like staying stopped at a green light for no good reason. And if you repeat trials over and over again, we see that the robot visits a set of states that look so very different from that of the humans. This difference creates a mismatch between training and test. And that is why the 99% training error we saw before was misleading because the robot incurs a much larger error on the test distribution. Okay, so feedback drives covariate shift. And we can't get rid of feedback, so we must get rid of covariate shift. How? If only we could ask the human what they would do in situations the robot gets into. The key insight is we can by interactively querying the expert on states the learner visits. By doing this in a clever way, we can make the training distribution look really similar to the test distribution, thus bringing back all the wonderful guarantees of machine learning. How do we do this? I will now talk about a very intuitive algorithm that interactively queries the expert. The algorithm is called Dagger, short for Dataset Aggregation. This is from a seminal paper by Ross, Gordon, and Bagnell. Dagger has four essential steps. Step one, you collect an initial set of human demonstrations and train a policy pi to map states to actions. Right, so this is similar to what you would normally do for supervised learning. Step two, you roll out or execute this policy in the real world and collect states that the robot visits. So in the traffic light example, you run the policy on the robot and you observe that it's stopping at a green light. Step three, you ask the human for the correct action on these states. So in the example, the human intervenes and goes. And so you see a data point where even though the previous action was stop, the correct action is to go. Step four, Finally, and this is the important bit, you aggregate data and train the policy on the aggregated data. It's important that you don't throw out old data for the theory to work. Now from step four, you go back to step one and repeat for n iterations. So in the next iteration, the robot makes less of a mistakes, but still begins to stop. Again, the human corrects and teaches it to go. And if you keep repeating this, finally there comes a point in time where the robot pretty much doesn't make a mistake and you're done. Okay, good, but why does this work? Uh, let's go back to our abstract state space. We have the distribution of states that the human visits that concentrates in a tiny region of space. Now let's take a look at the distributions traced out by Dagger. So in the first round, the robot goes all over the place. It makes many mistakes and does not know how to recover. In round two, it seems the robot learns to recover somewhat. By round four, the aggregated distribution is starting to concentrate. And by round 10, we see that this distribution has now completely concentrated in this much larger region than where the human visits. This is because even though the robot makes mistakes, it learns to recover and stays in a bounded set of good enough states. The dagger theory posits that the policy that does well on this aggregated distribution also does well at test time, and so the mismatch is resolved. And this brings us to the end. To summarize, imitation learning is a powerful way to implicitly program robots.
Instead of tediously tinkering with rules of tuning reward functions, just demonstrate how you would like the robot to behave. But you can't naively apply supervised learning even on the simplest of examples. This is because of feedback. The output of the robot feeds back in as input. Feedback drives a covariate shift between train and test distribution. Thankfully, there is a fix. Instead of passively collecting data upfront, you need to interactively query the expert on the states the learner may visit. And we saw a simple yet powerful algorithm dagger that does just that. And with that, we reach the end. You now have a choice. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you go back to your life and believe whatever you want to believe about imitation learning. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes.